Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone wherever in the world you may be. I'm thrilled to be part of this event, Eradicating Modern Slavery and Assessment of Commonwealth Government Progress on Achieving SDG 8.7. Uh, it's, it's an event that brings together a truly phenomenal group of individuals, each working from all regions of the Commonwealth to end the brutality of modern slavery. My name is Sne Arora, and I am the director of the London Office of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. And I should say that CHRI is very pleased to be organizing this event today, together with our partner, Walk Free. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Jackie Judah Larson, who is head of research for Walk Free, an initiative of the Mindaru Foundation. Jackie has led the organization's groundbreaking work on measuring modern slavery. She is a co author of Walk Free's uh, Global Slavery Index and co author of the Methodology of the Global Estimates of Modern Slavery, Forced Labor, and Forced Marriage. It's a collaboration with the International Labor Organization and the International Organization for Migration. I invite Jackie to formally open the session and provide the opening remarks. Jackie. Thank you, Sine. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar for the launch of the report, Eradicating Modern Slavery, an assessment of Commonwealth government progress on achieving SDG target 8.7. I'm delighted that we're joined today by guests from across the Commonwealth. And Walk Free was also very pleased to join forces with the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative to produce this report, which assesses government responses and identifies key gaps in addressing modern slavery across the 54 Commonwealth nations. For those who aren't familiar with the organisations behind this report, Walk Free is an international human rights organisation working to end modern slavery globally within our generation. It is the producer of the world's leading data set on measuring and understanding slavery. And we worked on systems change through advocacy with government, business and faith to ensure slavery is tackled through both a legal and a cultural framework. The Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative is an independent non-government non-profit organization that works for the practical realization of human rights across the Commonwealth. It focuses on access to justice, access to information media rights and freedom of expression, and contemporary forms of slavery and human trafficking. It does this through research, strategic advocacy, capacity building, and engagement and mobilization within the Commonwealth. CHRI also founded and is secretariat to the Commonwealth 8.7 Network, an international network of over 60 local civil society organizations with a common vision to end contemporary forms of slavery and human trafficking. So why this report and why now? Despite the postponement of the 26 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, CHRI and Walk Free wanted to ensure that modern slavery remains firmly on the agenda. The report is intended as a tool to engage governments, international and non-government organisations and civil society to take action on the issue of modern slavery, especially in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. The report we launched today highlights that 40% of victims of modern slavery live in Commonwealth nations, even though the Commonwealth is only home to one third of the world's population. And this speaks to the urgency of tackling all forms of modern slavery across the Commonwealth. This report should mark the start of a conversation with key stakeholders ahead of the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. If we are serious about achieving SDG target 8.7 and eradicating all forms of modern slavery by 2030 in the Commonwealth, we need to see this as the decade for delivery and to act on that. The report we launched today highlights that progress against SDG 8.7 in the Commonwealth is very slow and ad hoc. It also shows that although we've seen countries adopting some legislation targeting forms of modern slavery, the commitment to eradicate modern slavery must be followed by concrete action and funding. I welcome this report and I would like to thank everybody who contributed to it. I hope it serves its purpose to drive action towards achieving SDG 8.7 in the Commonwealth and more specifically that it enables effective responses to modern slavery which require coordinated and committed action from governments combined with a robust engagement and involvement of the private sector, civil society community groups and survivors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Indeed, uh, CHRI is very much appreciative of the partnership with Walk Free and we look forward to 
our collaboration strengthening over the coming months as we continue to work towards the, um, the rescheduled uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2021. A few housekeeping rules for everyone, if I may, before I introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, we have approximately uh, 100 participants um, here joining us on the Zoom event. Attendees are entering with their microphones and video off as they, as, uh, at the outset. Um, you'll notice that there's a chat box um, to the right of your screen. The chat box is there for discussion between panelists. You will also see the um, full bios of all our speakers there in the chat box, as well as relevant links to resources and other information. You can enter questions in the Q&A box. You can find that tab at the bottom of your screen. And I invite you to ask uh, questions throughout the event. They will be addressed to the panelists during the Q&A session, which follows the, uh, the main theme sessions. You can also upvote the questions by giving a, a thumbs up to those questions that you feel very strongly about. Um, one more thing throughout our session today, there will be polling. That is, we have a few questions for all of you, which will appear on your screens. Uh, we wish to hear from you, who you are, your thoughts on the issues that we're debating, and we will send you the first poll question now to test it out. You'll see the question uh, popping up on your screen, so please do take some time to answer it. And I'll have to do the same before I can continue. <laughs> In addition, uh, just to let everyone know that we are live streaming the session on YouTube simultaneously, and it will also be recorded and available for viewing later to those who uh, cannot attend. All questions that you pose from the chat box and uh, from the YouTube live stream will be fed into the Q&A box in, this, in the event, and we will be sure that the panelists will hear your questions. So that's a bit of housekeeping. I'd like to introduce now uh, to um, I'd like to introduce to you now someone who uh, needs um, really no introduction in this sector. She has been at the forefront of the UK's efforts to end modern slavery and push the Commonwealth to take action. Dame Sarah Thornton is the independent anti-slavery commissioner in the UK, responsible for encouraging good practice in the prevention and detection of modern slavery and the identification of victims. Prior to the post she currently holds, she was the chair of the National Police Chiefs Council from 2015 to 2019. So I would now ask Sarah Thornton to share her thoughts on the role of the Commonwealth in eradicating modern slavery. Sarah? So thank you very much. and. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, and thank you to, for inviting me to uh, share some thoughts on this really important report uh, that's launched today. Um, looking back to the Commonwealth Heads of Government in 2018, um, everybody was really um, uh, pleased that there was that commitment in the, in the communique to eradicating modern slavery and human trafficking. And about six months ago, I was doing some work on thinking about where the Commonwealth had got to since then. And what struck me on reading the reports, there were lots and lots of great ideas, but the issue was uh, one of implementation. So this joint report uh, by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Walk Free uh, is really well-timed um, because it shows very clearly what needs to be done if we're going to uh, deliver Sustainable Development Goal 8.7 by 2030. And, and although the report says there's been some progress, it's been slow. And, and I was quite depressed to read that little comment, very little has changed. Um, so I think this is very much a call to arms and a call to, to implementation. And, and if I may say so, the fact that the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting has been postponed until next year gives everybody another 12 months grace so that by the time that we meet uh, again, um, hopefully some progress uh, will be made. So the timing of this report is really uh, excellent. So in terms of the problem, um, Jackie mentioned that 40% of uh, the estimated uh, modern slaves uh, in the world are in the Commonwealth. Uh, the figure that really grabbed me was the situations of slavery. Um, Commonwealth citizens and people, I think, is a really uh, strong compulsion to act. And, and I was struck by the report um, that CHRI um, published, I think, in 2018, uh, where you argue two things, which I think are so right, that actually the Commonwealth in particular has a historic, a political and a moral responsibility to, to act. I 
absolutely agree. But more importantly, actually, it has the cultural, economic, historical and political ties so that it can really drive coordinated action. So both kind of um, there is the responsibility, but there's also uh, the ability to do an awful lot more. And I think the UK's role is really uh, significant in this, the importance of the UK engaging um, meaningfully with the Commonwealth, uh, particularly in times of global uncertainty, particularly because of COVID, and also that sense of the changing role of, of the UK. But I think it's probably just worth saying something which I, I, I think is important given the history that, you know, in the UK, we use the term modern slavery. We use it as an umbrella term to include human trafficking. But I do acknowledge that there are sensitivities with the use of that term throughout some Commonwealth countries. And I also absolutely understand the sensitivity about the UK and the UK's role, given our um, involvement, particularly in transatlantic slavery. But I think it's so important that we don't let those very real concerns stand in the way of helping and doing something about the levels of misery and exploitation that occur in Commonwealth countries uh, today. A couple of thoughts I've got in terms of uh, call to action. So I hope I've established why I think the Commonwealth should be doing something about it. Two thoughts. One is that um, many of you will know that back in 2017, Theresa May, um, issued that call for action at the UN General Assembly, um, asking countries to sign up to uh, that call to action to do something about it. As I understand it, I think at the moment only 27 out of the 54 Commonwealth countries have signed up to that. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we could increase that number before the Commonwealth Heads of Government next, next year? So we've got a year to get that up. But I also um, was struck in the report by other areas where we, I think we could really act. I, I know talking to Sne and Catherine several uh, months ago, you've had a problem with data gaps, but even when you've got your data, um, you know, only have about how to identify victims. Um, it's a little bit better on, in terms of prosecution. So human trafficking is criminalized now in 45 countries, that's better. But on the other hand, um, this issue of um, employees paying recruitment fees, it's only outlawed in 17 countries. And from all I understand about this issue, if people are paying to work, they end up in debt bondage and you've got a problem from the very uh, beginning. So I think that's an area where we could really try and get some, some progress. And then of course, what is the role of government about thinking about supply chains? Um, it's been a big issue in the UK in the last month or so, um, you know, we leave businesses to, to police their own supply chains. Some do, some don't. Um, but what's government's role in policing its own supply chains? And I think that the report says that only four countries have actually taken action. So it's not just about businesses, it's about what government can do to really kind of set the tone about what's expected uh, in supply chains. So um, I think there's a lot to be done. I think the Commonwealth is brilliantly situated to do more and I'm really looking forward to this morning's discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Sarah Thornton. For, and for those of you who have just joined us, she's the UK's independent anti-slavery commissioner. For our next session, I would like to introduce to you Catherine Bryant, who is lead of European engagement at Walk Free based in London and the key individual who has been working with us here at the CHRI London office for the past 18 months or more on this report. So together, she and I will take you through the key elements of the report, Eradicating Modern Slavery. She'll, we will take you through the research that we've done, the data we've collected, and some of the key findings on how government, how governments, Commonwealth governments have met and also have not met their commitments to eradicate modern slavery. So I turn it over to Catherine and request that the slide presentation be shared. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Say, and good morning or good afternoon and good evening to everybody. And thank you so much for joining today's webinar to launch the report Eradicating Modern Slavery, an assessment of Commonwealth progress on achieving SDG target 8.7. Um, as has been mentioned a few times, but just to really emphasize, this is the result of a partnership of 18 months worth of work between Walk Free and the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. And so it's, it's a great honor today to talk to you about some of the key findings from the report. I'm gonna try and now summarize that 18 months into two minutes uh, before I pass back to Sne to talk about some of the key findings from the report. 
Um, just one thing in a nutshell to emphasize, the report obviously provides an assessment of 54 Commonwealth government responses to modern slavery. And it provides a snapshot of progress as well. As Sarah Thornton was, um, was pointing out, in 2018, Commonwealth governments um, committed to achieve SDG 8.7 in, the, in, um, in the Commonwealth by 2030. And so we're looking at what's happened since those two years, in those two years. Uh, next slide, please. As with, um, with everything related to this report, the context, obviously the individuals who are experiencing these forms of exploitation. And we estimate that there, for every 150 people in the Commonwealth, one is living in some form of modern slavery. Uh, this comes from the Global Estimates of Modern Slavery, which estimates that 40.3 million people were in modern slavery in 2016. So put it another way, roughly 40% of that 40.3 million figure are living in Commonwealth countries. Uh, we know that all forms of modern slavery affect all Commonwealth countries, such as human trafficking, forced labour and forced marriage. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, the report provides an assessment of Commonwealth government responses. And to do this, we developed a conceptual framework first developed back in 2014 for the Global Slavery Index. And this um, conceptual framework is organized around five key milestones, which constitute a strong government response to modern slavery. I'll just go through these um, and give you a little bit more detail of some of the indicators that sit behind them. And um, the first one is providing support to survivors. And this covers information such as victim assistance programs, such as shelters or community-based programming, um, coordination mechanisms of, such as national referral mechanisms, as well as training for police and other first responders to identify victims. Strength in criminal justice is around um, ratification of international conventions, putting in place domestic legislation, as well as access to justice mechanisms. Improving coordination and accountability covers both national and regional coordination mechanisms. Addressing risk factors is underlying, addressing the underlying uh, factors such as discrimination or risks associated, associated with labor migration. And in the fifth dimension, which is really important, we look at the role of business and also looking at what governments are doing to investigate their own supply chain. So I was really pleased to hear that Sarah Thornton pointed that out it's equally as important. So there are the five milestones. If we can just go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is my attempt to summarize 18 months worth of work in one slide. Um, so to put this into context, um, the conceptual framework, those five milestones, sitting behind that are 116 indicators, which include the addition of 14 indicators from the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. Put that another way, that's about 6,300 individual data points that feed into this data set. This was done primarily through desk research, but also is greatly strengthened by our partnerships with local civil society. So 41 NGOs fed into the data collection and these 41 NGOs represented 18 different countries. We're also really pleased that we were able to include survivor voice in our um, data set. And so included survivors from five different countries. And I just wanna point out, thank you to the Commonwealth 8.7 network who were greatly um, fed into this, this data collection process. I will now pass over to Sne. Thanks everyone. Okay, thanks um, Catherine. Uh, so from, from the data that we've collected, we found that Commonwealth countries have made really uh, little progress towards their commitment to eradicate modern slavery by 2030. This is true despite, as, as Catherine mentioned, uh, despite an estimated one in every 150 people in the Commonwealth who live in conditions of modern slavery. So this means that only one third of Commonwealth member states actually criminalize forced marriage and 23 Commonwealth states fail to criminalize uh, commercial sexual exploitation of children. Out of the 54 countries of the Commonwealth, only four, that's only four, engage with businesses to investigate supply chains, as was mentioned earlier. And all countries of the Commonwealth report gaps in this victim assistance program. So we see that progress is far too slow. Governments are failing to meet their commitments they made to eradicate modern slavery at the 200, 2018 uh, Common, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. More must be done. With this report, what uh, CHRI and Walk Free have done is that we have assessed government progress to achieve SDG Target 8.7, which focuses on, of course, the eradication of all forms of slavery. And we also include recommendations to Commonwealth states on how they can take action to rectify these gaps. Next slide, please. So 
So during the upcoming sessions, we will be delving deeper into many of the key findings that um, we found on the, on the data gathered, but I wanted to go briefly here into some of the key findings. These are top line statistics. Within the first milestone on, um, or the narrative of supporting survivors, we found that though every country has some form of support services to survivors, we found that only a quarter of Commonwealth countries actually have a national referral mechanism to coordinate victim assistance. And 35 out of 54 countries or 65% reported gaps in funding for victim assistance programs. In regard to criminal justice, there, we found there is some progress. In 83% of countries, human trafficking is now criminalized. However, there remains gaps. There remain gaps in the criminalization of forced labor and all 54 Commonwealth countries have gaps in, in, in implementation. In connection with uh, improving coordination and accountability related to labor migration, 21 countries have bilateral labor agreements that provide for the protection of labor rights or labor migrants, only 21 countries. Next slide, please. When looking at how Commonwealth governments are addressing risk factors, there is, we see that there's near full adoption of laws or legislation which enshrine the right to freedom of association with 52 of 54 Commonwealth countries doing so. But yet, uh, if we take another indicator, only in seven countries, there is evidence that certain groups, for example, domestic workers or migrant workers are not allowed to unionize. And finally, looking at the status of eradicating exploitation and supply chains. Only four countries have policies in place related to public procurement, which minimize the risk of forced labor and supply chains, and also requiring businesses to report on modern slavery risk. This is something that we really need to improve upon. Also in, in, this, in this area, no country, no Commonwealth country has yet passed a law which requires business or governments to undertake mandatory due diligence to assess the risks of modern slavery in their supply chains. To rectify these gaps, the report also contains specific recommendations for Commonwealth governments. And these recommendations will be discussed in the next session. So we won't go too much into them here. Um, we call, we're, CHRI and Walk Free are calling for modern slavery to be set firmly on the agenda for the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. The report uh, that we are launching today recommends that Commonwealth governments launch, launch a major initiative which builds on the existing anti-slavery anti frameworks. But also we call on Commonwealth states and the Commonwealth Secretariat to come together and use the upcoming Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2021 as an opportunity to tackle modern slavery, to formalize global and regional coordination, strengthen legislation and develop monitoring frameworks to assess implementation. So should you have any questions about the report and the methodology, please use the question and answer the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. A link to the report will be added to the chat box at the end of the session. And uh, I ask that we go back to um, the speaker view to uh, for the next sessions, if we may. Our next four sessions, as you see in the agenda, will focus on issues that the report raised and aligned with the, with the milestones that, that Catherine mentioned. These are supporting survivors and the importance of survivor voice, uh, strengthening criminal justice mechanisms, eradicating exploitation and supply chains, and addressing the risk factors that push people into modern slavery. Moderating, the, moderating these sessions is uh, Joanna Hewitt James, who is executive director of the anti-slavery campaigning group Freedom United, and she is also chair of the board of the London Office of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. Joanna. Thank you very much, Sinead. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. We next are gonna be listening to conversations with guests and we'll be exploring the milestones that Sinead just outlined. We've got quite a lot to get through um, and I'm going to hold up a sign for my, in my conversations if you run out of time. Um, and we'll then move afterwards to data gaps before moving to a brief QA. So, but our first conversation will be led by Catherine and is on video for technical reasons. And it's on the crucial topic of supporting survivors and survivor voice with Francisca Awa Mbuli. She is the 
founder uh, of um, the Cameroonian NGO Survivors Network uh, the, and the director. She's a survivor herself of sex and labor trafficking and almost a victim of organ trafficking. Um, survivors Network is comprised of trafficking survivors that, and it raises awareness, helps victims escape their trafficking situations and offers temporary housing, vocational training and other essential services that survivors need for successful reintegration. So as I mentioned, we'll be doing this uh, by video. So I'd just like to ask Willow to please share screen and sound so we can listen to the conversation. Thank you. We're really pleased to be joined today by Awa Francisca Mbouli, who is the CEO and founder of Survivors Network of Cameroon. Francisca will be talking to one of the key themes of our report, which is the importance of providing support to victims and survivors of modern slavery, as well as providing avenues for survivors to feed into government policy responses. Now, it may seem obvious to us that supporting survivors and supporting victims should be at the cornerstone of any government response to modern slavery. However, in our report, we found that despite the existence of some services in every single Commonwealth country, there were several gaps in these services. For example, some groups are excluded, such as men and boys, migrant workers or LGBTQI individuals. We also found gaps in um, funding for these services. Roughly two thirds of the governments that we looked at had reported some kind of gap in funding. So Francisca, based on this, in your opinion, how can governments provide support to survivors to ensure that they're meeting their needs? What the government needs to do to make sure they are taking into account the needs of survivors. The government needs to get survivors together and hear from them what they need. Because you can't solve a problem by listening to another person who is not affected by that problem. So the government in their various countries need to get a platform to meet survivors and talk to them, to hear from them what they really need to get themselves back into their various communities and not only getting themselves into that communities, but to be resilient in that communities. So I think when the government hears from them, as a survivor speaking, I know we have problems like medical problems. We have come back, we've been through so many abuses. We need to be medically checked up. We need psychosocial support, counseling, bringing us to forget all what we've went through. And most importantly, to be resilient in those communities or to reintegrate themselves into communities, they need to be doing something to sustain themselves on their daily livelihood. So I think the government needs to give opening for survivors to be trained through vocational training centers owned by the government. The government should make it free for them to be trained. And then the government should make survivors to be fitted for those who have qualifications into various job opportunities offered by the government. I think with all these, survivors will be very okay and they will remove the code of being a survivor to be normal and to move ahead with life with hopes. Thanks so much, Francisca. There's some really excellent ideas of how Commonwealth governments can better support victims of modern slavery, including the very simple ask of, ask of bringing survivors together and asking them their opinion of what the policy response should be. Now, at the beginning of this session, I included some evidence of the gaps in responses. We also found evidence of policies or act actions on behalf of governments, which was hindering or preventing the protection of victims and survivors of modern slavery. For example, we found that in 12 of the 54 Commonwealth uh, countries, there was evidence that victims had their freedom of movement restricted or were locked up in shelters. We also found that only 16 of the 54 Commonwealth governments actually provided training for those providing services for victims. So beyond what can be done by the government, what are some of the other actors or mechanisms that are critical to support survivors and to ensure their protection? I think when survivors are rescued, they need so many things to support and protect them. First of all, survivors on their own part, when they are rescued and they return back to safety or to their communities, they need to get in touch with various civil societies that they know are working on combating human trafficking. Because when they get to the um, civil society, that serves as an umbrella to bring them together 
That's why most importantly, survivors' networks in various countries are encouraged in whatever they are doing because that seems seems all is as a network that brings survivors of various abuses specifically human trafficking together under one umbrella so that together they can join their voice and make changes so in respect to survivors protection and support when they have returned home i think they need monitoring because when they come back home, they need constant checks because they have gone through a lot, they have gone through trauma, and if there's nobody to check on them timely, I think some of them might have secondary thoughts of doing something bad, or they might still be vulnerable to secondary human trafficking or to be retrafficked. So, but when they are connected to such civil societies organizations, they tend to listen to them, attend programs with them, and they know that there is hope. These organizations make them to see that there is hope ahead. And I think survivors themselves has a great role to play. They have a great role to play in protecting themselves and in supporting themselves. Because what specifically survivors network of Cameroon usually do is any survivors that they come in touch with, they always encourage the survivors to be able to speak out because I think as a survivor, when you speak out, you are in turn healing yourself and you are making change to your communities. So survivors need all those supports, those services for them to push ahead with life. And also some of those supports can be gotten not only from the government, but most importantly, most of them, they are gotten from civil societies organizations that have been working with survivors who don't have their passion to bring survivors back to life. Thank you, Francisca, and completely agree about the critical role of civil society in providing support to survivors. In the production of this report, both CHRI and Walk Free reached out to survivors as best we could to provide avenues for input. This included providing review and feedback on our conceptual framework, verifying our information, as well as providing quotations that we've used throughout the report. Now, often we find that there are barriers or challenges to survivors to provide input to um, policy making. Could you provide an overview of what those barriers are and also what are the opportunities to overcome these? Survivors have challenges and barriers in participating in policy making and law making that concerns them in their various countries. This is because most of times the government sees survivors as low class set of people or at most often survivors are not qualified or highly educated to chip in something to make policies that will affect them. That is not good. I've seen cases specifically in Cameroon where I've been caught on a yearly basis by the ministers, actually the prime minister, on the table to talk with him on what survivors need. We go there, we talk with him, we we'll deliberate for like four to five hours. And after we've done, we've given them all what we need. Survivors, civil society organizations working with survivors are represented on that same meeting and they're speaking for the voice of survivors. We tell everything to them. And after we are gone, nothing is being done at the level of that government, of the government. Everything we say that they stay that day until the other year when we'll be caught again. So I think the government needs to do something. Many things need to be done. People, policies are being made concerning them should be playing a great role in making that policies that concerns them. So this is something that needs to be redressed by various governments. Survivors need to be on the sea in any things or any law, any country who wants to enact or put in place concerning them. So that is really lacking. Their voices are not heard. They are not being called on the table to deliberate what concerns them. So it's something that needs to be looked upon. Thank you very much to Catherine and particularly to Francisca for a very powerful overview of why survivor voice is so important. Um, Francisca is actually with us on the webinar, but we pre-recorded that just to be sure that we wouldn't um, find that we lost her due to an unreliable internet connection. I'd also like to say that I'm really grateful, Francisca, for your role 
as a member of the Commonwealth 8.7 network, which uh, for those who don't know is a group of 60 plus uh, organizations around the Commonwealth with a common vision to eradicate modern slavery. So as I mentioned, um, we are continuing with our conversations on milestones and the next one is on strengthening criminal justice mechanisms. So as we know, the global response to human trafficking has centered somewhat on criminal justice responses and the ratification of international conventions. And of course, very importantly, how that translates into domestic frameworks, as well as the application of various uh, access to justice mechanisms. So in our report, we find that many uh, countries have ratified relevant kind of conventions. Um, however, there are still some gaps definitely, um, particularly uh, on the protocol, um, the forced labor protocol to the Convention 29 and implementation in, in, in domestic legislation in, to the full extent. Uh, have, having said that, there have been some really good um, progress that we've found in the report. So now I'd like to invite um, the next guest that I'll be um, speaking to, and that is uh, Right Honourable David Hansen, who's a former uh, Member of Parliament and um, Chair of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association uh, UK. In his tenure in Parliament, he also served as Minister of State for Security, Counterterrorism, Crime and Policing, as well as Shadow Treasury Minister and Minister of State for Immigration. So to kick us off, um, David, I'd just like to ask you, what are the gaps that you see in ratification of international conventions and criminalization of modern slavery? Well, thanks, Joanna, and thanks everybody for the report. Uh, the report is very positive in the sense that it highlights where there are deficiencies in not just aspiration, but mostly in implementation. And I welcome the fact that we've seen, uh, you know, movement since the Commonwealth Conference last year, two years ago in the Pakistan have uh, now taken legislation through, the Gambia have, only this month, Uganda, following uh, input from the UK Parliamentary Association from the Commonwealth have now introduced a bill on modern slavery. But the reports on the previous slides show that there are real gaps in implementation. And you know, things like, for example, that there are now five countries that haven't uh, ratified the ILO domestic workers uh, uh, activity, or that we've got nine countries that haven't actually criminalized human trafficking so far. Now, those are really important gaps. And I suppose that the discussion for us is how do we put pressure on government? And each of us in our own areas now can look at the 50 plus Commonwealth countries, look at the benchmarks that are being set by international law and look at how our countries are stepping up to the plate on those international obligations. And if they're falling short, then we can talk in a moment, Joanna, about what pressure we can put on government through parliament, through civic society to raise those issues because we have a responsibility to hold governments to account, both internationally, but also my government uh, and everybody else's government in the Commonwealth countries, we have a role to hold them to account. And the gaps we've identified in the report very clearly are areas where we can now put political and social pressure on. Great, thank you. Um, and who would you say are the key actors um, to strengthen those gaps that you've just identified within the Commonwealth? Well, I think, first of all, government has a central responsibility. Um, in the UK government, uh, with cross-party support, we introduced the Modern Slavery Act around seven years ago to solidify modern slavery legislation. Uh, government has a central responsibility because in all countries in the Commonwealth, government ultimately will agree or disagree to legislation, whether it's brought by backbenchers, opposition or by government itself. So government is key. But government doesn't operate in isolation. Government is you and me, Joanna. Uh, we form the government, we choose our government, we put pressure on our members of parliament. And I think it's important that, that all of us in individual capacities, but also in our organizations, in civic society, in business, in voluntary groups, in women's groups, in survivors groups, like um, Francesca talked about, we put pressure and ask our members of parliament to look at what are the gaps in our legislation, what are the gaps in our implementation, and ask them to raise with government. 
Uh, I, I know as a, as a government minister, if I received a box full of papers from MPs raising issues, it would be on my agenda, whether it was on my agenda or not. So, um, and, you know, that's really helpful, actually. And I think that is important for us to remember. And I suppose the next challenge after you've um, got the uh, parliamentarians lined up and you've got the legislation passed is, is getting it enforced. Um, is there any particular uh, mechanisms that you can identify um, to ensure that legislation is actually enforced in practice? Well, I, I first of all, just refer people to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association in the UK branch. We have a handbook which helps members of parliament and civic society draw together how they can implement and dra draft legislation and bring it together. And if people do an internet search for the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Modern Slavery Handbook, there's a pile of information on that which can be used. En enforcement is key. Uh, and enforcement means that the police, the judiciary, the prison service need to know what the legislation is, what their powers are, and that uh, an, an agency such as uh, Sarah Thornton's Anti-Slavery Commissioner needs to monitor separately what that enforcement is. I'd refer people to uh, Sarah's excellent um, annual plan for this year, which shows that there is, first of all, monitoring prosecutions. Are prosecutions happening? Are they happening in particular regions or cities? Are there discrepancies between prosecutions? Why do prosecutions fail? Um, how are police understanding legislation? How do police enforce that legislation? What's the role of civic society? And again, uh, Joanna, I'd say that you know all of us are, are, are police officers in our own communities. Uh, there will be in communities in the United Kingdom issues of modern slavery, on you know, prostitution, on exploitation. Uh, on you know, in, in my local county, we suddenly found recently uh, people working in a shed under modern slavery conditions that was found by members of the public who saw mm. it happening and reported it to the agencies so i think there's a there's a there's a collective responsibility for us to monitor information and monitor that enforcement great thank you so much thank you for your insight that's really helpful um i'm going to move on to our second topic really appreciate your time david um, now, do remember that you can post your questions in the Q&A as we're going along and we'll get to them after we've gone through the, the uh, topics. The next one that we'll be uh, exploring is eradicating exploitation in supply chain, so the products and goods that we buy. So it's estimated that of the roughly 40 million people who are in modern slavery around the world, 16 million are working in and exploited in the private economy so forced labour permeates global supply chains um, and migrant workers are particularly at risk, which, uh, as a report highlights, um, has been really exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our report found there are very few governments that are engaging directly with business. Only four of the 54 Commonwealth countries are holding business to account for forced in some way for forced labour in their supply chains. Um, UK, Australia, Cyprus, Cyprus and Malta, who are also taking action to ensure their own procurement. So business, state procurement, sorry, state government procurement is free of forced labour. However, there is a lot more that could be done. So I'm going to now introduce our next guest. Um, that's uh, Vera Belazakolska, and she's the director of programs um, at Ulula in Canada and she there she leads the design and implementation of programs to monitor human rights impacts and global supply chains together with partners from the public, private and civil society sectors. Vera has 10 plus years of experience in international work focusing on community engagement, financial inclusion and education in parts of Asia, Africa, Central and South America. So Vera, welcome. Um, to start, uh, why is this problem with government and business supply chain so pervasive in your opinion? Thank you, Joanna. Um, yeah, so globalization and, and global trade have definitely created many opportunities and have helped emerging markets lift millions of people out of poverty. But of course, slow regulation and really fast trade development have created these gaps where exploitation and human rights abuses can, can begin to fester. So. 
um, that that is uh, that that dynamic has created that breeding ground for continuation and if not even expansion of labor rights exploitation around the world. Um, and also, we see a shift in consumption. There has been in the last decade a demand for really cheap goods and a culture of disposal that you know all of us are. Um, you know, are, are um, perpetrators of, and, and that has created a race to the bottom on cost um, for a lot of businesses. And that has begun to compromise the, the performance on societal and environmental impacts. Um, and just to, it wouldn't be fair to, uh, to not speak about the complexity and opaqueness of supply chains today. Um, they're multi-tiered. Um, there's a lot of subcontracting that happens that is not oftentimes disclosed nor monitored. Um, and then, of course, due to challenges in supply chain mapping, businesses struggle to oftentimes identify the, the societal risks in their supply chain that go beyond the tier one, the first direct um, supplier. So, and, and oftentimes the risks do lie further upstream into the supply chain. Um, and, and finally, you know, there is a, a challenge with shifting corporate behavior. It requires a, a mindset shift um, from, from focus on profit to focus on people, planet and profit. And we're seeing a shift in consumer preferences, legislations uh, being enacted and a lot of investor pressures. So we really hope that that's going to continue to propel uh, more change, but there is a, a lot of room to grow in, in shifting that corporate behavior. Absolutely. I, I uh, agree with you wholeheartedly. And what about the role of governments in holding business to account? Of course, we know that um, governments are responsible for protecting us from human rights violations and um, businesses are to respect those, um, those human rights. So um, what can government do? Yeah, um, well, the UK, Australia and two other governments, they have the, they have requirements. Um, the UK and Australia have the mandatory requirement for businesses and government to report on an annual basis the, their action, the actions that they're taking uh, and that businesses are taking to ensure that there is no modern slavery in their supply chains um, and their own operations. And this has included different types of uh, approaches. So, you know, the, the companies can report on their whistleblowing mechanisms and um, how they're working with their suppliers to increase training on, um, on labor rights issues. Um, of course, there's strengths and weaknesses of both of these, uh, these legislations. And the, the UK Act in 2015 was really kind of the first um, of its kind globally to seek that, that was seeking to comprehensively address both the definition um, as well as the enforcement of modern slavery crimes. Um, and it, it was the first to attempt to address the role of complex supply chains um, and what their role is in, in um, masking the linkage between global business and, and modern slavery around the world. So, but of course it has been criticized for lacking enforcement mechanisms um, and oftentimes businesses do, um, given the, the legislation, they, they have put a lot of their focus on commitments and policies and procedures rather than um, kind of focusing on the monitoring and enforcement element um, of course, there's a big opportunity to go beyond um, beyond to start thinking around supply chain traceability because you cannot report on what you cannot see um, and then continuous monitoring and really going deeper into their supply chains. Uh, there's Canada and New Zealand are now looking to enact legislation as well. Um, so Great. that is currently under review. They're examining, examining their legislative options. And we recently saw the Western Australia has now included a debarment uh, regime as part, as part of their, um, their legislation, which uh, will really kind of um, hopefully through encouragement uh, get companies to report um, because uh, if they do not, they would be excluded from government contracts. So that yeah. is a, an interesting new development of how governments are trying to uh, work with business to keep them accountable. Definitely. And just very briefly, um, knowing that we are, we've got a lot to get through. Um, what role would you see the Commonwealth itself taking? I think there are some interesting moves in this space, but uh, do you see a particular role for the Commonwealth in, on this topic of supply chains? Yes, of course. So we're seeing the European Union recently announcing the development of a legislative proposal for mandatory human rights due diligence. The Commonwealth countries as well can be an entity that can look into the different approaches and try to model against each other's approaches to level out the playing field, create more consistency. Um, the reality is there will be a diversity in approaches from uh, carrot to stick, uh, similar to the French duty of vigilance law with lots of penalties. 
all the way to kind of uh, reward systems. Um, but ultimately the goal would be that it would create a race to the top for businesses. Um, and it would be uh, definitely uh, an, a, a step forward. Um, of course, reporting and disclosure doesn't mean that change on the ground will be happening. So uh, continuous monitoring would be extremely important. So I'll end on that note. Thank you, and I, and I agree. Thank you very much for your insights. It's, it's uh, really good to flesh, flesh it out. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, so our next topic is on addressing the underlying risk factors. And we know that modern slavery is really uh, coming together of risk factors um, and uh, vulnerabilities, so including discrimination, poverty, limited economic development. Um, but despite this, often responses are very heavily focused on criminal justice. And you know, I think it's clear that COVID-19 has made very stark these underlying inequalities creating vulnerabilities that need not be there. Um, so our report found that we have to tackle risk factors. Uh, we have to see that, and it is a big gap in government responses. So across all regions, there are gaps in social safety nets and including access to education and respect for, for labor rights. But to, to talk a bit more about this, I'd like to introduce our next guest, and um, our next guest is Anusha Chandrashukran, and she is a journalist by training with close to 10 years experience in the development sector. She's worked on several research and capacity building assignments that aim to enable community participation in different stages of development projects, particularly in the context of gender and sexuality, disability, child rights and modern forms of slavery. So she's working with communities marginalized by sex, gender, occupation, caste, class, religion, and ability. Um, and uh, you can see from that that she's got a lot of experience to, to share with us. So to start, um, Anisha, I'd like to just ask you um, a bit about uh, vulnerabilities and the groups that are particularly at risk of modern slavery. Sure, thanks, Joanna. Um, so I'd just like to start off by saying that when we talk about modern forms of slavery, uh, it seems to take away systemic and structural factors and replace them with some forms of modern, uh, like some modern forms of inequalities and uh, relationships. But in reality, what actually happens is modern forms of production are merely replicating and reaping the benefits of age old hierarchies of caste, gender and patriarchy. So just to draw some examples from our experiences, it is uh, seen that generally subcontractors um, are uh, from dominant castes and workers, especially in informal economies, they are from disadvantaged castes and classes. Um, so, and also when a worker tries to exit these scenarios through uh, various ways, probably through entrepreneurship or something like that, and maybe seeks a bank loan, they are asked being a Dalit, like being a, from a disadvantaged caste, what really gives you the right to have such lofty dreams? And if the person is a woman, in addition to being a Dalit or a tribal uh, entrepreneur, there are also sexist comments about like uh, women uh, aspiring for this isn't your place in the hearts and not uh, in business. Um, so these kind of prejudices are already there. Um, and when we look at, um, uh, like for example, if you're looking at women workers, they are seldom in, uh, especially in garment uh, factories where, uh, like drawing from uh, some of our research with the uh, workers led think tank, uh, women workers are seldom seen in positions of authority wielding power over their male colleagues. Additionally, there is a gender distribution of roles within the workplace um, and they just enforce these uh, vulnerabilities. And women's control over their body, over wages, over their rights become just tools to be negotiated at every stage, be it something like a menstrual uh, leave or be it uh, something like uh, equal wages. Um, Secondly, another thing that I would just uh, point, want to point out here is uh, given the COVID-19, um, uh, like ever since COVID-19, it has created a vivid imagery of migrant workers who have been stranded without livelihood, therefore without money for food or rent, and who have thereby, uh, thereby been forced to walk thousands of miles at great personal risk. And several workers have even lost their lives during these uh, journeys to trying to get back home. There is this tendency for source as well as destination states to pass the buck on providing uh, migrant workers with their basic entitlements and rights. Um, 
and now migrant workers are emerging as an important constituency even the report talks a lot about the migrant workers in their plight and this is a great thing but the worry is um, is there is it going to is there going to be a loss of pluralism by clubbing all migrant workers as a monolithic group because when we are talking about migrant workers within them there are multiple categories of people who are, have faced uh, discrimination traditionally for centuries like what about dnt uh, what about uh, nomadic and uh, nomadic workers who are left out of the discourse because, because they do not even get counted in the census um like to talk about the discrimination they face when a nomadic uh, tribe settles in one place for generations over time they are still called a paradisi in a tamil uh, it's a tamil word and the word implies vagabond or uh, like a an alien but what it actually means is it is being used as a slur and uh, they are not even seen as part of the system where they are living in for uh, generation and uh, again another um, another group of people who are on the margins of law and morality and they are heavily stigmatized are sex workers recently a study by reputed universities suggests that sex workers are super spreaders of corona virus and therefore all red light areas should be banned for months it doesn't even talk about what kind of threats this is going to pose or what what kind of risk this is going to pose to the sex workers themselves um so such mm-hmm. biases basically reinforce the vulnerability of some groups over the others and incru- increase their risk to uh, land in exploitative situations and people like so here these biases are like people hailing from slums are then seen as unsuitable for recruitment they are untrustworthy or homeless persons are branded as being lazy or people from denotified tribes are branded as thieves so it's very easy for us to create these brands and perpetuate them and uh, reinforce them so those and those who don't have identity documents recently we've seen in the country tend to get invisibilized and they fall through the gaps of rights and entitlements and they ultimately land on a like a sympathy bed of um, just charity so what they are, yeah. they can't then talk about their rights but only talk about uh, receiving dole one thing i wanted to ask you i think you really outlined quite how systemic and embedded uh, these problems are considering that how how would you say governments can can go about addressing these very complex intersectional factors sure uh so like government can uh, definitely they can look at ensuring labor protections extend to all groups of people um uh, extending laws and policies to all groups of people regulating recruitment processes especially when uh, states are rebuilding their economies in the context of covid-19 and uh, here it is important to note that uh, covid-19 has seen um, an attempt for dilution of labor rights uh, for some very progressive legislations that have been there and that these should not at any uh, stage be replaced by dole based approaches so that's one i could think of and the others like for example supporting regional and national level uh, research on trends prevalence and it's absolutely um, amazing if this can be done through a community led initiative so we for example we i just want to talk about an initiative that we uh, have called collect which is mainly an attempt to community led evidence based advocacy um and this is aiming to collect data from close to 1000 locations across india and what this is trying to do is workers uh, to um, the mar- people on the margins are not just data points but they are actually uh, user users of are you owners and users of that data and they will use this for advocacy then again um, tackling uh, systemic inequality and discrimination is something that uh, draws from what i uh, spoke about initially and what many of the other speakers have also um uh, told uh, spoke about we need to remember that in an attempt to root out modern slavery we do not forget the principle of leave no one behind absolutely uh, again addressing yeah and uh, addressing like specific vulnerabilities on women and uh, communities that are uh, more uh, prone to discrimination and stigma and last point i just want to point out that covid-19 has shown us that no country is really an island and mm-hmm. we need to remember that while we are pushing national governments to become more accountable to people and global frameworks like neoliberal frameworks from the west like those that calling for ease uh, you know ease of doing business they tend to put uh, governments of um, developing countries in an unfair position where they prioritize growth at the expense of equality and human rights this is just something that we need to introspect on and think about uh, in any way forward 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Anusha. I'm sorry as well that you were unable to join us um, on video as you planned. But the good news is, is that we could hear you very clearly and hear the very, very important points that you made to really outline quite how um, important it is that governments do think about as part of a risk or uh, part of their assessment of how to tackle and eradicate modern slavery, the risk, uh, sorry, the discrimination and um, systemic issues that you outlined. So very grateful for your time. Thank you. Um, I'm Thank now you. going, you're welcome. Um, I'm now going to move on to the last section before we do our Q&A. Please don't forget that uh, you can post your questions in the Q&A and you can also use the upvote to indicate which ones you like. That will also dictate perhaps the, the questions that we'll go through. Um, but we're going to move now on to a brief few minutes on the data gaps. And I'm going to introduce Raja Baga. He is a senior researcher with the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and a lawyer by training. And he's worked extensively on issues relating to prison reforms and police accountability. Um, Raja led the team in the research and publication of this report. So it is absolutely right um, to welcome him and, and, and to hear him speak briefly about some of those gaps. Thank you, Raja. Um, thanks, Joanna. Um, yes, sorry. Um, so in the last one year, while right, we've, we've been conducting this research, uh, we've come across extensive uh, work on modern slavery, which has helped us develop this report. However, it's also important to recognize that we found that there's been, there have been certain aspects of modern slavery where uh, there's been systemic lack of government data. And that's what I've intended to talk about right now. Um, so there are primarily three areas that we found there was a systemic gap in uh, government data on modern slavery. First of them was the data on prevalence of modern slavery. Uh, so while there exists this extensive work of WACFI and ILO in the global estimates of modern slavery, however, uh, which actually helps us understand the magnitude and extent of the problem, uh, there's a clear lack of government data uh, across all the regions of the Commonwealth. And to be able to um, design better measures, increase uh, beat prosecutions, to be able to understand whether resources are being well spent, uh, we need to understand both victims and perpetrators, and therefore we need more uh, data on prevalence. The other uh, aspect where we, we found issues with data was information relating to implementation of laws and policies on modern slavery. So these uh, issues included um, le like levels of prosecution and convictions, uh, implementation of national action plans, longitudinal data on uh, re-victimization of survivors, amongst others. There was clear, uh, with respect to implementations, limited information in different, and that way in different uh, regions. Uh, the third aspect was with respect to information on uh, supply chain oversight. Now, uh, taking forward what uh, from uh, Vera's session actually, that she detailed actually the challenges with uh, supply chain and also what the report uh, shows, it would be fair to say that these, uh, that the lack of data is a reflection of the fact that there's been a clear government inaction in holding businesses to account for traffic persons for forced and child labor, uh, child labor in their supply chains. Now, and, and therefore, whenever we, we, the data that we try to gather with respect to reporting mechanisms, existence and uh, imposition of penalties, compliance audits, all of these barely yielded any information. Now, given this, um, so just trying to understand what could be the possible reasons why this, uh, the data gap exists. One is clearly, as I said, a reflection of government inaction. The other is the complexities involved in data gathering as well, which and, and the hidden nature of modern slavery, the regional specificities, as well as the capacity of member states. The other is also lack of will among governments to be able to share this information publicly. publicly. Now, uh, given, given these challenges, what, what were the suggestions or recommendations that we sort of put forth? One is um, uh, to, that the need for Commonwealth and the Commonwealth member states to come together to formulate minimum standards on collecting as well as sharing data and share good practices uh, with respect to modern slavery. The other also is uh, to have to uh, expect uh, civil society organizations to create a demand by seeking more information from the government on these areas, which are usually uh, not disclosed. Um, to sum up briefly, um, I, would, I would say that while publicly available information on modern slavery has grown over the years, uh, which, is, which has allowed us to actually, as, as 
Catherine mentioned earlier, look at 116 indicators to comprehensively understand government responses with respect to modern slavery in order to further strengthen this understanding, in order to ensure that policy decisions and inter interventions are evidence-based, that resources are allocated to maximize impact, we expect the government to do more. This would be a crucial step in uh, eradicating modern slavery. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Roger. It's so interesting to hear the detail of uh, the data gaps that you found in, in, in conducting this research and putting this report together. We appreciate your efforts. Um, so as mentioned, we are now going to move into the Q&A section. Um, you can ask a question to anyone on the panel. Um, we are also streaming um, on YouTube where there'll be questions which will be fed in. Um, there is a rating system and looking at that, we are going to start first with a question on how do we ensure victim-centred approaches in criminal justice systems and monitoring business and government supply chains. Um, so a real question around victim-centred approaches. I mean, it, it really is an important topic. Um, I, we've had a couple of uh, people have made that submission and some votes. So um, I would like to open the floor to the panelists and uh, please do raise your hand and I'm keeping my eye out to see who, who's got, who'd like to respond and come in on that question. David, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for the question. Um, as Sarah will know, as the Anti-Slavery uh, Commissioner, there is enshrined in UK legislation, a section part five of the act, which gives rights to victims. It gives protection from victims from prosecution if they're involved in activity due to modern slavery. It gives legal rights to them. And I think the central thing, first of all, is for any government in the Commonwealth to enshrine victim support in legislation. And then through, for example, in the UK, we have the Victims Commissioner who will give advice and support on those issues as well. Uh, the key thing, therefore, is to give a voice to victims. And in government policy, as Francesca mentioned, it's really important that victims are involved in both evaluating legislation, designing legislation, and helping police forces and the judiciary to enforce legislation. Many thanks, David. Um, so, uh, Sarah, would you like to come yeah, in? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Um, in particular, the point about monitoring supply chains. One of the things that I think is absolutely essential is that we think about um, the powerlessness of victims in speaking up and the fear that they have of speaking up and their lack of confidence in the system, their lack of trust in the system. And what can we do in terms of worker engagement? What can we do with grassroots organisations, with community organisations, to really encourage people uh, that they, you know, that it's safe to, to, to raise things and they will be protected? I think the points that were made earlier on about workers' association and workers' rights, you know, if if we are listening to our staff, then we should be kind of, you know, encouraging people um, to, to speak up. So I think that's a really key part on the supply chain uh, side of it. In terms of um, victims and survivors, um, I, I thought that uh, Francisca made some really great points. Uh, and it's so important in all that we do, whatever our contribution is, that we are taking time to listen to victims and survivors, however many barriers there might be to that. So I think we can all do it in our own jobs. But, you know, at the moment in the UK, the government are looking at the national referral mechanism to, to change it and to transform it. And every time I discuss that with them, I say, you know, you must listen to victims and survivors, the people who are most affected. If it's about us, do it with us. And I think that's really important. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I, I, I very much support that. Um, I think that's you know definitely a weakness in um, the effort to end modern slavery. The you know just not having um, enough space and empowerment for people who really understand and have got lived experience to share. Thank you very much for those. We have a question from Andrew Koo from KL. Um, he is asking, how can we encourage governments in the Commonwealth to take modern slavery more seriously? He points out that COVID-19 has forced many countries to look at how migrant workers are housed, for example. Many live in quite cramped conditions, um, which of course has helped lead uh, to quick and easy spread of the um, COVID-19 and help, not, not helping with containing the pandemic. 
Um, so question on how to encourage governments to take modern slavery more seriously. I know that's not everybody's got their video on. So if this is a question that you'd like to answer and you're on the panel, please do unmute yourself. I'll keep my eye out open. I mean, Joanna, of course, my responsibility is getting the UK to treat these issues really seriously. And it's a constant um, uh, push to, to, to make sure that politicians are really concerned and engaged. And I thought David's point that as a minister, if you're getting emails and letters from MPs, then you're going to act. So actually uh, making sure that we link in with parliamentarians to make sure that it's important is a key kind of act, action in the UK. And I suspect that's the, 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 the same elsewhere. Yeah. But I also think, I, I, I'm going to creep into my summing up points, but I do think we need to think about um, with the Commonwealth heads of government coming up. And I see that John Davis has raised the point about the Commonwealth Games uh, yeah. in 2022. Um, how can we use those structures of the Commonwealth? Um, how can we say to the, you know, try and get the Commonwealth Sec Secretariat much more engaged in this? Um, you know, who are their leads? What are they doing? How can we kind of use those uh, multilateral structures to try and push this across the whole of the Commonwealth? Yeah. Uh, David. Can I just add one sentence? I think the most effective thing we could do is to try and get each and every government in the Commonwealth to have one single ministerial lead who has ownership of the issue of modern slavery. If it's across several departments, if there's no focus by a minister, it will not be driven through. So you know, political parties in our areas, whatever political party in discussions, we should be trying to get a minister who is responsible for driving through the changes. Yeah. And I'll add one, one more element on the migrant worker uh, issue. I think what's really important is for governments to ensure that employers have whistleblowing and reporting mechanisms to amplify worker voices in multiple languages. It seems so obvious, but that is oftentimes not the case. Grievance mechanisms are not always available for migrant workers because of language barriers, but that is definitely something that um, can, can be more easily done. It's a low hanging fruit and a, a bare minimum. Um, and I think that can hopefully uh, uh, encourage more migrant workers to report non-compliance with physical distancing and um, better uh, personal protection in the workplace, especially as they are accommodated in workplace uh, accommodations and hostels where there's, mm. as Andrew mentions, are quite crammed and oftentimes unsafe. Thinking actually about the other end of the um, supply chain to the workers and sort of taking that point on to the consumers. One of the questions that we have is about how, a very practical one, I mean, how do you actually go about making sure that you're not inadvertently complicit in what is slavery or perpetuating it? I mean, so a question from Emma Kerr on, you know, when I go to a nail salon, how do I check the staff for not, not being exploited? if they don't speak my language, is there a certificate or something? I mean, what, what, what's the way that as sort of individuals going about our daily lives, we could um, do something to this regard? Anusha. Um, I think uh, like there should be some way of uh, like ensuring that, uh, like it's uh, also talking about um, governments to, uh, governments should also ensure that uh, these kind of violations do not happen. And um, I think this, this question about like going to uh, any place and knowing, so it would be good to have like a, a crowdsource kind of a platform which lists out um, uh, ethical uh, service providers, be it for anything from uh, garments to nail salons to anything else. And also just to add a, a one point to uh, the earlier discussion, mainly on uh, governments also taking a lead uh, as a, model uh, employers as well as model procurers. So governments should encourage that they buy from um, like say child labor free uh, production systems because they are, uh, they are large scale procurers. So, and they should encourage this, they should take the lead there. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions that are somewhat interrelated. Um, I'd like to call on Francisca to give her input, hopefully, um, We'll have the good enough technology to make it work so we can hear from her live and, and that is really on the question of um, the role of youth so there is a question from 
um, Kritika Chowdhury on the, um, when it comes to discrimination, how do we just change um, attitudes and involve youth in that change? How can we educate the next generation? And what kind of strategies, leading into a question that Hannah's put forward, I'd like to ask Francisca, like, you know, what kind of strategies could we maybe try to use or we've seen be successful in um, changing perceptions among young people? Thank you so much, um, Joanna. I will start by saying that young people are still young and at this early stage, if you want to change their perceptions about what they look and so that was like, we just need to keep doing really I'm just my hand is over the hand is over the um, microphone. Hello. Hello. So try again. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Monique, I'm getting the question. I'm getting you. Are you getting me? Yes, I can get you now. Yes. Actually, I didn't get the questions um, clearly. I got the last part about the perception, changing the perception of young people. Yes, that's so, exactly it. Changing the perception of young people in, I didn't get the first part of the question, please. It's the same part. Um, you know, what strategies, how do you change attitudes and maybe youth being a key, a key part of the solution? Okay. Actually, that's a great question. Thank you so much. What um, a grassroots organization has started doing at each in combating human trafficking and modern slavery, like when they start at the standard age that we are engaging in, going to schools, meeting them, educating them, creating awareness to children, children ages five to maybe 15. At, that age, they know that they are aware of what we are trying to tell them. And it is advantageous that when they grow up, their perception about human trafficking will be something that they know is not good. And they know they need to join hands with their community, with their country to fight against. And another reason why we do this to change their perception is also to get them engaged in this fight and to make them know that it does exist. Because when they are grown up, I think, at their own level, at their age, adolescent age in the various country. I think things will be better. They will know what is happening and they will be very happy to be part of it, to make a change towards modern day slavery. Um, I would also just like to add to that, Joanna, if that's okay, to Kritika's question. Mm -hmm. um, so Kritika, I just want to tell you about some work that we are doing. Uh, we work with um, uh, we work with um, communities uh, that are traditionally into sex work, and uh, we uh, build capacities of young persons there uh, as community research fellows uh, and encourage them to uh, take up research questions either related to the issue of traditional sex work or of anything else like uh, the challenges in accessing education or other forms of livelihood because of the stigma and discrimination. And, uh, um, and basically encourage them to change the narratives because that's the only way perceptions is going to change, whether it's for this generation or the next one. Absolutely, I think that's absolutely true. Um, there's just so many um, really important points that uh, um, you've raised and the, thank you very much everybody for your questions. I think we've got to the real core and the meat, if you like, of um, this topic to really draw out some of the big systemic issues that need to be addressed and the challenges that we're facing today. Um, really uh, thank you to the participants and my guests for the great insights and experience and knowledge and learning that you've shared with us. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, Catherine Bryant. Thanks so much, Joanna. And just to echo that, thank you so much to all the panelists and also to you, Joanna, for excellent moderating of those different sessions. We had an awful lot of information, really detailed contributions and some very interesting questions. So thank you to everybody. Um, I'm now going to pass straight over to Dame Sarah Thornton to summarise those findings in about five minutes, if that's OK with you, Sarah. Thank you very much. And I'll try and focus on the kind of um, what needs to be done. Um, and I've got five points. Um, the first one is that point about the 
Commonwealth health, heads of government agenda and who is doing the work to really make sure the, com the Commonwealth Secretariat um, understand how important it is, you know, how are we sharing the report? This report's got great data in. There's nothing like data to make the argument. So hopefully that will be uh, a, a really important point. The second point, as I said, you know, I thought what Francisca was saying about survivors and survivor voice, you know, the things she talked about in terms of work, um, the work she does in terms of helping people to live lives of sustainable independence, all the entrepreneurship stuff, it echoes so much uh, of the sort of stuff, the best stuff that's going on in the UK. You know, how do we get survivors with that lived experience really involved uh, in, in the work? And somebody I noticed on the chat commented about maybe the Secretariat hasn't got many resources and there are lots of Commonwealth organisations. So something like uh, Alliance 8.7 that's bringing together all those NGOs to share good practice, to share ideas, seems to me to be a really good thing. So that would be my second point. Let's make sure that all of us are in the sector, are sharing the ideas and kind of creating that kind of pressure and activity in the system. The, the third point, and it's kind of quite a few people mentioned COVID, um, and um, the way in which it has impacted uh, disproportionately on the, on the most vulnerable. Uh, and it does strike me as an opportunity to use this as a, an inflection point, particularly around, I think, the point that Vera made about um, it's about, you know, people and planet as well as profit. And, and, it, and, you know, and there is, you know, there's movement in the US and the UK about, you know, stakeholder capitalism, thinking more broadly about responsibility to employees, to communities, to consumers. And, you know, what can we do in terms of COVID to make that a real inflection point um, where we think about um, it's not, as somebody said, growth at the expense of human rights. It's about growth and kind of human rights. It's about decent work right back to uh, SDG 8.7. So uh, can we use COVID as an inflection point? The fourth point I was going to make was the point, quite a few people talked about supply chains and just thinking about global supply chains, um, whether it's the UK thinking about new trade deals, whether it's some of the Commonwealth trade organisations that some people on the chat mentioned. What is the opportunity to kind of think about that? You know, the worst thing that happens as, as far as I can see is if there's pressure on a retailer in the UK, you know, they will about something that's happened, you know, thousands of miles away. The easiest, and I think probably the worst thing to do is cut off that supplier at the first sign of trouble, because the people who really get hurt, are the, often it's the women and girls who are working in those textile factories on very poor pay and in very difficult situations. So, you know, how can we, when we think about international relations, trade relations, really kind of think about protecting the most vulnerable as a key part of that. And the last point, um, I think you kind of reminded me, if I needed reminding, I, I meet regularly with colleagues in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department for International Development and with the um, Modern Slavery Envoy, Jennifer Townsend. And all of them have been to some extent um, kind of taken off to deal with COVID. They are coming back now. And I think this is a real opportunity to have some joined up work as the Foreign Office and the Department for International Development begin to work more closely together because of um, desire to, to, to amalgamate them, but also thinking about how I can work with Jennifer to really kind of push this agenda uh, in all 54 countries of the Commonwealth. So thank you for a great report. As I say, nothing like data for concentrating the minds of politicians, I hope. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Sarah, for summarising so eloquently all the many themes that were discussed in today's seminar. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, now, we have just one final speaker before we uh, finish up for today. I just wanted to really uh, quickly just draw attention to a few things that will be happening in the chat and also over the next coming, uh, few coming days. Uh, we will be sending out an email to all participants and all attendees with a very short um, survey asking your opinion on this webinar. Please do be honest in your feedback. It's really helpful for us to improve these as we go forward. Um, secondly, we will also um, be releasing the, um, the URLs to the reports, both on the CHRI and the Walk Free website. These will be going into the chat uh, shortly, um, so you can look at the, uh, the report itself. So finally, I'm really pleased to introduce um, Sandra Hazari Hazarika, who is the International Director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. He is a rights activist, author and columnist, filmmaker, who's designed the boat clinics on 
uh, sorry, uh, Brahmaputra uh, River that reaches a quarter of a million people with healthcare in his home state of Assam. So Sanjay, I would like to pass over to you for your closing remarks. Thank you, Catherine. Um, at the outset, I want to express my deep appreciation and respect as to all of us for the remarkable sweep of ideas and experiences that we've heard of research, of coming out of personal trauma as Francisca Awa so poignantly shared with us and the unique contributions of our panelists. There are incredibly tough challenges before us, even if we are to convert them into opportunities. Thanks are due to the incredible teams of CHRI and Walk Free. Uh, led so ably at CHRI by Sneha Rora, our director in the London office and our team. Raja, Pooja, Richard, Hannah, Charlotte, uh, Willow, Lara, and Verena, and all interns who did such amazing work. Catherine uh, Bryant, you, you lead the European engagement at Walk Free and your team, especially Jackie uh, Larson and Francisca and your, your team at Perth who worked with enormous patience with each other through long days uh, weeks and weekends. You've survived deadlines and each other. Uh, and I'm talking about CHRI and walk free. And my prodding and pushing often not very pleasantly. For that, apologies are due and gratitude. Our thanks also uh, to Professor Alison Duxbury, our chair of International Board of CHRI, and Joanna, who's our UK chair, for their constant inputs and our superb communication team in India of Aditya Sharma and Ajit Mishra. Uh, thank you for empowering this multidimensional effort with the engine of research and strategic skills for clear targets. And having listened to this, uh, this narration of passion and facts, we don't intend this to be another report that gathers dust until the time for another Chogam comes around. There are too many of those. We're not interested in another set of calls for commitment and action. We want this to be a program of action that is anchored in a rare joint initiative and partnership, not just between CHRI and Walk Free, but between stakeholders, governments, mandated institutions, and organizations like the Commonwealth Secretariat, UN Special Procedures, and a greater coalition for the greater good of CSOs to establish a rare partnership to end this modern day gulag. So this is not really a call for action as we did, as CHRI did at the report we launched in 2018. It's a plan of action. But for that plan and that strategy to work, it needs to in be inclusive, empathic, and rich in many initiatives which we have spoken about today. And I'll just highlight a couple in closing. At the top, is the need for governments, NGOs, and academicians to be informed by the voices of survivors and their participation in responses and policies. And this has been reflected both in the questions we've heard today and in the responses. We have, it's time bound. We have 10 years left if we are to free 15.2 million people from contemporary forms of slavery. That means 4,000 persons every day for the next six, 3,650 days or more. And those numbers of people who face trauma, brutality, and bondage and need to be emancipated are just in the Commonwealth. And the pressures are everywhere on criminal justice systems and law enforcers to uphold rights. And everywhere there is one narrative. It is implement, implement, implement. And there are actions in law which need to be taken. We've gone over that. And coordination in, is vital, while exploitation in supply chains is an area where all government, Commonwealth governments have virtually failed. And the need, as has been stressed, uh, to not to overlook root clauses because these sharpen vulnerabilities. And if you're serious about 2030, then I think we'd have to show results in the year ahead because in this year, we have a year before Chogam 2021 in Rwanda. I'd like to thank uh, Walk Free and Mindaru Foundation for their support in enabling this project, this program, this process, 
and this report to come out. And we've collaborated for the past two years and we endeavor to work together across the Commonwealth through our offices and the Commonwealth 8.7 network as well. For there are millions whom we have never met in the flesh and whom we may never see. Time is not on our side, but we take courage from Gandhi's talisman. And especially in these terrible times of a pandemic, when if you are honest we are with ourselves, we are not just restricted, restrained and vulnerable, but we are also fearful and often far from those we love and whom we have not met for long. And Gandhi said, whenever you're in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest person whom you may have seen and ask yourself, is the step you contemplate, will it restore him or her to control over his or her own life and destiny? Then you will find your doubts and yourself melt away. That is our banner. That is our slogan. That is our anchor. And that is our talisman. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good evening, a safe year, and stay very well. Thank you.